Hello. So in this lecture, we will look at some air quality control methods. Broadly, we can divide these methods into some bins. For example, source management, then engineering controls, which could be local exhaust, general ventilation, or at air cleaning or management controls for example work schedule management training and cleaning of workforce these were some air quality improvement techniques during the covid-19 pandemic so you know of course the person let us say was emitting some virus there was a social distancing then humidification which sort of led to the you know uh, non uh, Air, which led to the movement of aerosols downwards towards the floor and not in the people's breathing space. Then there was purified air circulation. There was a disinfection intervention in this air uh, AC system as well. This air circulation system. We had ventilation. Then there were some plants. Use of face mask and portable air purifier as well and the indoor air quality was monitored. Source management generally includes removal, substitution and enclosure of sources. It's actually an effective control method. For example, the US Consumer Product Safety Commission recommended installing low VOC emitting carpets and encouraged consumers to ask carpet retailers or installers for a voluntary green label program. Green and white logo displayed on carpet in that sense, uh, you know, could for example communicate the conformance of manufacturer's product for low emissions. Also another option was installation of temporary barriers for preventing pollutants during construction activity because in this case the outdoor pollutants could come inside through windows so if there was a temporary barrier to this movement one would have less uh, transfer of pollutants indoors then the other option was engineering controls for example through local exhaust the use of these local exhaust uh, and you know shading and fume hoods could be effective uh, compared to the baseline scenario for example exhaust can be useful in removing point sources of pollutants before the dispersal into air so like kitchen or just above the kitchen stove one can also manage the general ventilation so we have the for example our single sided ventilation cross ventilation stack ventilation we have to design the ventilation accordingly and allow for substitute uh, allow for sufficient uh, transport and transfer of clean air a well designed and operating HVAC system will also in ensure comfort because it can regulate the temperature and relative humidity and allow for infiltrating air to come indoors sufficient enough to meet the needs of uh, ventilation for building habitats and also help in eliminating odors and pollutants. But of course, we need regular inspection of HVAC systems and uh, you know, and when like you know, when we are moving or changing some building characteristics, again HVAC system should be inspected. Also for specific situations such as during housekeeping and construction when the emissions of indoor air pollutants would be uh, you know, high, one could temporarily increase the ventilation to dilute the vapor concentration in air. There are things such as ultra ducts are being proposed. They improve air quality by disinfecting the airborne bacteria and viruses. And this can be installed in the supply duct or the return duct. This increases the life of HEPA filters and also minimizes cross contamination. Some engineering controls also include air cleaning, which involves the removal of particles from the air before passing through the HVAC equipment. 
For most such systems, filtration is provided to eliminate dirt to promote the heat transfer efficiency. It is commonly observed that there is smudging around the air supply diffusers in a ceiling due to the entrainment of dirt particles in space. Then the next kind of management control is maintaining for example uh, or the next kind of control or mitigation method is management control. For example, in this case work schedule. So the managers may decrease the amount of exposure to pollutants in the respective buildings by eliminating or reducing the amount of time a worker is exposed to a pollutant. For example, by scheduling the maintenance when the occupants are not present. Then one can reduce the magnitude of exposure to chemicals in this way. For example, then there will be limited amount of chemicals by uh, you, you being used by worker in maintenance, uh, then we will have less chemical associated exposure. One can also control um, you know emissions or do some management at the location of chemical use. So perform maintenance work on movable equipment in separate area without causing exposure to the other workforce and locate the equipment such as printers to a separate room because they are actually also emitting uh, things such as ozone or, uh, or fine dust. Commu uh, workers can also be trained. So one can communicate to workers about sources and effects of pollutants under control and have a system of warning and also other systems by employers to decrease the exposure of workforce. One can also use good cleaning practices for preventing the entry of the dirty air. For example, you know remove dirt once accumulated, have a proper garbage disposal, a good storage of food facility and a good facility for storage of other chemicals. And use a good choice of chemicals for cleaning products so that we can have reduced VOCs. So that's that basically means methods to minimize the pollutant entry. This we have already seen in a way hierarchy of hazard control except now we have the most effective on the down and the least effective on the top. So most is basically just eliminate the source then we can substitute the hazard. Then we can have engineering controls which means isolate people from the hazard. Then administrative control meaning change the way people will work. And then of course PPE which means protect worker with PPE. In the residential building there was another uh, sort of option which was to move the person out. But probably you one cannot achieve this in the office environment. Good design measures can also be adopted. For example, fresh air can be provided into the building at sufficient air change rates to minimize moisture buildup, which in turn will reduce mold and body odors. Ventilation inlets and exhaust should be positioned at least 10 meters apart, otherwise whatever exhaust comes out immediately goes in. So these should be at least 10 meters or so apart. Then ventilation, kitchen or any combustion exhaust should not be discharged into enclosed space because that would mean sucking the polluted air from one place and uh, putting it in another place. So they should basically exhaust should go out and where it can the pollution can be diluted. Uh, air quality sensors are a new thing and they may be provided for areas of the building which have a variable occupancy pattern. Uh, mechanical ventilation can be provided as required and appropriate gas phase and particle filtrate system will need to be installed if the outdoor air quality exceeds standards and ventilation systems are exposed to these levels. Filter performance needs to ensure if gas and or particle filtration is used for reducing pollution. Appropriately, one has to design pipe work and ducting to prevent condensation on their surface because we may start having surface reactions. Plants and soils should not be located in proximity to air intakes because due to resuspension of pollen, dust, VOCs, fertilizers and pesticides can contaminate the air and plant growth may even block the inlet as well. 
one can plan the shape and orientation of the building for allowing prevailing winds to displace the pollutants from the building because an improper building design will cause stagnation of the pollutants one can also consider pressure differentials in tall buildings where air movement can pull in ground level pollution and suck it up to higher levels the winds in the higher levels will might be high so they are moving and the air from bottom is also moving up and the is being sucked in in this high movement air inlet should be located upwind of any local source so that we do not bring the local source in one can develop a pressure map to help ensure that indoor air contaminants do not contaminate the surrounding areas one can include fine particle filtration within the ventilation system to minimize dust and pollen effects on the occupants one can also apply some construction measures for example one can choose low voc emitting construction materials one can use paints more effectively in damp areas to try to prevent mold growth if any absorptive material is exposed to moisture or humidity then one should give it uh, sufficient ventilation to dry the material within a reasonable time frame when there is extra dust during construction temporary ventilation should be provided air should be provided from moving from uh, the construction should be prevented air should be prevented from moving from construction areas to any occupied indoor area and no construction or waste material should be stored in mechanical or electrical rooms of a set indoor setting <coughs> the mechanical ventilation may be used for ventilation during construction for a minimum of 1.5 air changes per hour and wet methods may be used to clean up the residual dust one can replace so once during the construction is happening there was one set of filters and one has to replace all the intake flavors of filters after cleaning is complete but prior to the occupation being uh, like if, uh, if it's a residential house the occupation will be the family moving in but all these uh, you know replacing of intake filters should be done before that a building flush out may also be performed during occupancy and during the flush out all ventilation system should operate at basically normal flow rates and the interior temperature should be maintained the use of tobacco products electronic smoking and other control substances should be prohibited within the building and within 7.5 to 10 meters of the building entrances or building intakes Tack mats may be used along walking routes from dusty areas to minimize dispersion of dust. No liquid fuel generator plant should be used indoors near any ventilation intakes, or near any open windows, doors, or even trickle or purge vents. The site should frequently be cleaned to minimize dust resuspension, and if wet or mouldy material is identified prior to building refurbishment. the material surface should be dried and remediated after demolition works are completed and one should then allow any wet stray cellulose to dry before covering one should also allow for curing time and off gassing during scheduling scheduled construction activities one can install carpets acoustic panels as furnishings after the interior has been finished one can ensure all construction workers are provided appropriate personal protection equipment to avoid adverse health effects if there is any material which is containing silica which is used during the, uh, during construction this should be the removal should be carried out using water suppression of dust and if there is any non road mobile machinery indoors the exhaust fumes of that machine must be funneled or piped to the exterior one should also consider monitoring dust levels during construction at many different locations to get a better picture of the dust load so some monitoring recommendations can be all monitoring of formaldehyde and other vocs should be carried out in accordance with ioc or iso or other agencies 
VOC sampling should include measurements of one continuous hour prescribed by the reference testing method. So this is important. What is in accordance with agencies or following any reference testing method. One exposure field blind samples must also be prepared and analyzed for day of sampling so that we know that our uh, our procedure is clean. Particulate matter sampling should be carried out with the minimum detection limit appropriate for the criterion selected. Carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ozone sampling should be carried out using some appropriate method for each of the three gases. Real time direct reading measurements with minimum detection limit appropriate for criterion selected but this is not always possible because the detection limits may be different for different gases. But ideally one should try to use as few as, uh, instruments and get as much data as one can. Monitoring should be conducted under typical conditions and not any special situations. For naturally ventilated spaces, the window should be open during testing. In mechanically ventilated spaces, the window should be closed and ventilation should be active during the testing. The sampling location must be representative of typical occupied areas, right? Because we don't want to give alternate location for analysis when no one is occupying that particular alternate location. So sampling locations must be uh, representative of the typical occupied areas and within the sampling zone and located where occupants would often be situated. Sampling must be taken around 1.1 to 1.7 meters above the finished floor, so something around the breathing zone. Sampling locations must represent exposure of the population being considered, which may require sampling to be example at least 1 meter away from walls, doors, windows, air supply, exhaust outlets and any occupants that are present during monitoring. So, you know this. Um, this is also important if the person needs to collect some sample then they have to make sure they are not contaminating the sample otherwise stay away. For buildings with multiple floors measurements must be distributed across different floors including the lowest and highest regularly occupied floors. Monitoring samples should be collected from same locations on three consecutive days during normal operating hours and then the average can be calculated for each set of three samples. If possible, samples should also be taken outside the air intakes at the same time as indoor samples are taken, so that one can match the indoor to outdoor relation. Where levels are identified to exceed limits or guidelines, appropriate measures should be implemented in accordance with the IAQ plan. Where existing buildings are retained, monitoring of indoor air quality within these buildings should be carried out before the construction starts. So in summary here we have uh, you know reviewed various indoor air quality methods for example use of duct filtration systems, work management and use of control devices. With this we conclude uh, this lecture.